Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Sunday, 3 March 2024. It is the 195th anniversary of the birth of Sir James Fitzjames Stephen, who was born in London on this day in 1829. Anyone with the slightest acquaintance in the humanities, with the humanities, will be familiar with the name of John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill was both a great philosopher and a great writer, so he left a significant legacy and influence. And we could even call him the secular saint of liberalism. Today, because of his success and his fame, he's read largely in isolation from his critics. So he is contextualized in terms of the influences that preceded him, like Bentham, obviously, and the tradition of utilitarianism that followed him, but not so much contextualized in terms of his critics. And this gives us a one-sided view of intellectual history. Sometimes we refer to the sequence of great books that define the Western tradition as the great conversation. We understand that people are writing books that respond to people over a, hundreds or thousands of years, and, and so they're conducting a dialogue uh, through historical time that we call the great conversation. But when we only consider the most famous books from the great conversation, we're only listening to one side of that conversation. So it's like listening to one side of a telephone conversation. If you think of what it's like when you listen to one side of a telephone conversation that you in, that interests you, when the other when the person hangs up, you want to ask them, well, why did you say that? And what did what did they say? And what happened? And so you 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 get part of the message, but you don't get the whole thing. If you want to understand why what was said was said, you have to get both sides of the conversation. So listening to one side of a telephone conversation is not going to give you a full understanding of what was said, and listening to only one side of the great conversation is not going to give you an understanding of history. In fact, I would say it's going to be certain that you're going to misunderstand history if that's the way that you look at look at it, and you not and you're not going to understand how we got to where we are today if you only get one side of the story. The so one of the missing voices from the great conversation is James Fitzjames Stephen, whose birthday it is today. And he was, among many other things, a critic of John Stuart Mill. In his time, he was mostly famous as a jurist. And he uh, he was fairly influential in law, both in England and in uh, and in India. And in fact, um, uh, multiple nation states of the of the British Commonwealth had adopted some of the laws that he worked on. So he was not without influence, but he is little read today. So why is John Stuart Mill so well known, but James Fitzjames Stevens is not? Uh, why are Mill's works considered to be classics? And they're available in mass market paperback editions, but it's very difficult to find a copy of Stevens' Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. One answer to this question is that Mill was on the right side of history and Stephen was on the wrong side of history. I have to say, in recent years, I've become to hate the I've come to hate the expression the right side of history which is usually pronounced with a smug sense of self-aggrandizement because anybody who uses it clearly believes themselves to be on the right side of history. And it follows from this that anybody who doesn't agree with them is on the wrong side of history. We could stay instead, and somewhat less tendentiously, that Mill was on the winning side of history and Stephen was on the losing side. And as we all know, it's the victors in a conflict that write the history of the war. The history that has elapsed since Mill's time has been largely written by those in the tradition of Mill, or at least sympathetic to the ideals that he espoused. 
So you could say we live in an age of liberalism that it is at least to some extent the triumph of John Stuart Mill's vision. So imagine as a kind of counterfactual to get a sense of what happened with John Stuart Mill, imagine that if after Plato had died, the Greeks went on to found cities based on the principles that Plato wrote up in the Republic and subsequent history reflected this triumph of Plato's vision. This is kind of like our relationship to John Stuart Mill. It's a philosopher's vision transformed into policies and institutions. Mill's principles were concretely acted upon. So he's on the right side of history, or at least the winning side of history, while Stephen's philosophical vision has fallen into obscurity since his time, leaving him on the wrong side of history, or at least on the losing side of history. But of course, in reality, it's not that simple. History is always more complex than, than, you, than you first believe it to be. Many of the laws that Stephen formulated during his time as a jurist in India are actually still in the books. So this is a very concrete way of shaping the future. And if we measure historical rightness or wrongfulness by actual legislation, Stephen was on the right side of history. And you know, while Mill has been very influential, he didn't actually write legislation that has been adopted by nation states. So we, there is at least one sense in which you could say Stephen was on the winning side of history and Mill was on the losing side of history. But, but if we measure influence by the principles espoused, then it's Mill who was on the right side or the winning side of history and Stephen who was on the losing side. But even here, the victory isn't quite clear. The ideals espoused by John Stuart Mill could be compared to actual policies and institutions that have been created since his time, uh, largely uh, attributing themselves to the inspiration of John Stuart Mill and his doctrine, but they, but these institutions and policies might fall short of Mill's vision and thus be an imperfect expression of it. Uh, so the you it, it's not necessarily true that Mill's vision and principles have triumphed. Something inspired by Mill's vision and principles has triumphed. But to the extent to which it is an authentic and accurate representation of Mill's vision, that's another question, and I'm not going to consider that at present. But if the ideal in found in a philosopher's vision is something we still strive after, even if imperfectly, then Mill is still the champion in history and Stephen is still on the losing side. But of course we have to ask, does might make right? If you're on the winning side of history, does that mean you're on the right side of history? Or does it merely mean that your side was stronger, better organized and more capable to carry out the fight in history and be on the winning side. And if the next development in history after the present overturns the gains you and your side made, does that mean you were right for a short time, but now you've been proved wrong? Or does it mean that you were always on the wrong side of history because ultimately what you tried to do was overturned and now you're on the losing side? Does history have a single unilinear direction so that when you align yourself with the direction of history, you are thus on the right side of history? And if you fail to align yourself with the direction of history, you're on the wrong side of history? This is related to the problem of directionality in history, which I discussed in my episode on Hugh Trevor Roper and what I called his purposive movement criterion for historicity. But for, for purposes of analytical clarity, we should distinguish between the problem of directionality in history and the problem of purpose in history. Even if the two, directionality and purpose, always or mostly coincide, we can see that the two ideas are different in subtle ways. In my episode on Georg Zimmel, I discussed the careful distinction that Zimmel made between purpose and value. And we could do essentially the same thing with 
purposiveness and directionality. The two are logically distinct, but are usually found together. And a more exhaustive analysis would be probably helpful for understanding what is meant or what is intended to be meant by the expression, the right side of history. One of the problems of attempting to clarify an insufficiently formal and under-theorized body of knowledge like history is that we end up using a lot of folk concepts and familiar metaphors, and then our metaphors are eventually mixed and they don't work well together. The idea of sidedness in history as being a right side, as there being a right side and a wrong side, is essentially a, a spatial conception, and it doesn't work well with the concepts of history. Um, it, you can you can gloss over it, but if you come back and try to analyze it carefully, you'll you'll find that your metaphors are mixed. I assume that the idea that is intended to be expressed by a claim of sidedness is that the future is on one side and the past is on another side, although these are directionalities of history rather than sides of history. But we can we can call them sides if, if you really want to use the phrase being on the right side of history. The implication is that if you align yourself with the future states of affairs, then you're on the right side of history, while if you align yourself with past states of affairs, then you're on the wrong side of history. Past or future alignment might be a better way of expressing this idea as opposed to being on the right side or the wrong side of history, but it has its problems too. There is no one single past and no one single future to which we are referring when we say the past or the future. One might establish as a kind of convention that we mean some particular time in the past or some particular time in the future that is or should be obvious from the context of the claim that we're making. Still, that is not very clear. And probably the lack of clarity in a claim like this is a feature rather than, than a bug because it allows the person making the claim to leave this position undefined and unclear which allows them to dodge any criticisms by disclaiming any inference that the individual doesn't want to claim as their own. So let us take it as a given that in our present history, John Stuart Mill appears as the prophet of the ideals by which we live today, so that Mill is lionized while Stephen is forgotten. Mill was not only aligned with history, he pointed the way for history, while others pointing in other directions are shown to be false prophets because the direction they were pointing was not the directionality of history. But consider a further possibility. Suppose that the society embodying the ideas eloquently given voice by John Stuart Mill runs its full course, declines, decays, goes extinct, and is ultimately replaced by another society. So further suppose that this later society does not share the ideals of John Stuart Mill, but rather shares the ideals of James Fitzjames Stephen. Stephen's books are excavated from moldering libraries, and he is hailed as a prophet of this society. And since he is further into the future than Mill, uh, Stephen was the greater visionary and the greater prophet because he saw further ahead to the right side of history further down the line. History has not yet come to an end, and if we don't annihilate ourselves, it will not come to an end for a very long time. In the long future history that awaits our species, there may be societies that come in to being which thinkers forgotten today are seen as the authentic expositors of some ideal that they try to realize with the society at question at long, at long last brought to actuality after only being potential, potential ideals espoused in some long lost forgotten work. Now, you know, excavated and brought to light as it were, made actual by a society that's trying to live by these ideals. This process can continue for as long as civilizations rise and fall, and for as long as there's a historical record to which these future civilizations can refer to, to understand the antecedents of their distinctive ideals. But we can go even farther than this. 
We can posit a sequence of societies in which first Mill is lionized, and then Stephen is lionized, then Mill again, then Stephen again, and so on, world without end, amen. This is what we would call cyclical history. Cyclical history does not exhibit the kind of directionality in, assumed in, uni, in a unilinear account of history. The societies that rise and fall in turn might be quite different in detail, and certainly they can be distinguished by their absolute position in history. But if we were to reduce societies to the ideals they hold, then so societies are cyclical when their ideals cycle back and forth from one ideal to another over historical time. Is there or can there be any right side of history to be on when the rise and fall of civilizations exhibits one side and then the other in turn? We can pull back a bit on our claims and still defend them. We can say that someone is on the right side of history when they are aligned with the present trajectory of history, being aligned with something that is not yet in development as a social force, in this case, wouldn't count. But what is this other than a measure of conformity? Do we want conformity to be our moral yardstick in history? I know I don't. So what were Stephen's ideals and how did they differ from John Stuart Mill? To give some of a flavor, but not a full exposition of Stephen's criticism, John Stuart Mill, I'll quote from a paragraph from chapter six of Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. And like many 19th century English authors, Mill included, Stephen's sentences are long and paragraphs can be very long. So uh, I'm just taking an extract and it's worth it to read the whole thing as always. Quote, that that upon some terms and to some extent it is desirable that men should wish well to and should help each other is common ground to everyone. At the same time, I cannot but think that many persons must share the feeling of disgust with which I, for one, have often read and listened to expressions of general philanthropy. Such love is frequently an insulting intrusion. Lord Macaulay congratulated England on having been hated by Braille. To hate England was, he observed, the one small service that Borel could do to the country, unquote. To pause to say that Stephen was referring to Bertrand Borel, who was in part responsible for establishing the Committee for Public Safety after the French Revolution, and therefore in part responsible for the reign of terror following the French Revolution. So continuing on, quote, I know hardly anything in literature so nauseous as Rousseau's expressions of love for mankind when read at the light of his confessions. Keep your love to yourself and do not daub me or mine with it. It is the, critic is the criticism which his books always suggest to me. It appears to me that the French way of loving the human race is the one of their many sins which it is most difficult to, to forgive. It is not love that one wants from the great mass of mankind, but respect and justice. It would be pedantic to attempt anything like a definition of love, but it may be said to include two elements at least. First, pleasure in the kind of friendly intercourse, whatever it may be, which is appropriate to the position of the person to not love each other. And next, a mutual wish for each other's happiness. If two people are so constituted that such intercourse between them as is possible is not agreeable to either party, or if their views of what constitutes happiness are conflicting, I do not see how they can love each other, unquote. So full disclosure, I share Stephen's disgust with expressions of general philanthropy and his nauseous reaction to Rousseau's expressions of love for the whole of humanity. Anyone who has lived in the world without being sheltered knows how superficial and how hollow such proclamations are. And I do not think it's possible to love everyone uh, for pretty much the reasons that Stephen states. And if it's not possible to love everyone, then claiming to do so, so is either false or aspirational. If it's false, it's intentionally false and it is intended to mislead. And that is not going to have a good outcome. If it's aspirational, 
then it's an aspiration that is it, it is impossible to fulfill and to maintain an impossibility as an ideal is a failure of wisdom. When a society constructed upon the lie of generalized philanthropy, which corresponds to no genuine human emotion, well and truly fails at an enormous cost in human suffering and misery, being on the right side of history as formerly defined will mean being complicit in this suffering and misery. Admittedly, the passage I just quoted puts Stephen in a rather negative light, but it also shows his tough mindedness. And it may be untimely to be tough minded, but it's also needed to make today as much as ever. So what's the foundation of Stephen's untimely views? This is a complicated question and I won't attempt to give a complete answer, but I will give a partial answer that will highlight something I think is really important. I think the connection between Stephen's fundamental philosophical views and his social views are also untimely, uh, but they're untimely because they're unexpected. In 1875, Stephen, who was part of a society called the Metaphysical Group or the Metaphysical Physical Society, I think, that exchanged, had meetings and had papers on philosophical topics. For them, he wrote a paper titled Necessary Truth, and he made the following explicit claims numbered out. Quote, one, all our knowledge comes to us through faculties, each and all of which are constantly liable to error which we cannot in all cases detect. Two, all our knowledge is expressed in language which, when closely examined, may be resolved into metaphors more or less inappropriate to the matter at hand and capable of being misunderstood and perverted by anyone who looks at it from a point of view a little different from their own. Three, all our knowledge includes an element of memory or anticipation, each of which is in the highest degree fallible. Four, all our anticipations involve an assumption utterly incapable of proof that the future will resemble our present conception of the past. Five, many of our anticipations involve an assumption which is probably false, that no new forces with which we are at present unacquainted will come into play and affect the results which we anticipate, unquote. This is a pretty thoroughgoing statement of what we would today call fallibilism, which is to say the simple idea that we might be wrong. And this points to what I would call epistemic humility, recognizing that we can be wrong, explicitly recognizing that we can be wrong and conducting ourselves uh, accordingly. It's important to point this out in this context because the heirs of John Stuart Mill, who today claim to be on the right side of history, also usually style themselves as being entirely in the spirit of scientific fallibilism. Not even claiming to be right, they only hope to be less wrong. And what could be more epistemically humility than epistemically humble than only wanting to be less wrong instead of actually making the claim to being right? The heirs of Mill would likely characterize their advertise adversaries as being founded on a kind of epistemic hubris. With Stephen, we can see that this is clearly not the case. He made his epistemic humility explicit in this essay. The idea is that the heirs of Mill rightly claim the epistemic humility, humility of science. Mill and science are on the right side of history. Therefore, Mill's adversaries and are guilty of epistemic hubris and must be on the wrong side of history. It must also be supposed that those forces that are not aligned with the preferred directionality of history must be aligned with each other. Thus, you may count yourself with the angels or with the devils with no third possibility, tertium non detur. Is this a helpful way to understand history? I don't think so. So happy birthday, James Fitzjames Stephen, and thanks for listening.